Joseph Zyciński developed this idea, uh, the idea of field of rationality. Uh, and um, he considered it to be a kind of environment to uh, think about rational, uh, rational explanation for the effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences and strongly connected this idea, the idea of the field of rationality with a platonic stand in the foundations of mathematics. Uh, later on, Zyciński switched to a less metaphysical interpretation and less, well, less metaphysical interpretation. And he identified the field of rationality or at least its subfield that is related to the world with the, as he called it, nominal aspect of the universe. That is to say with a network of potentially existing patterns which at the appropriate time uh, are instantiated as laws of physics. For instance, uh, the Kepler laws of planetary motions uh, could be regarded as such a pattern uh, for functioning the world. And in the beginning of the universe, say in the Big Bang, uh, Kepler laws um, existed only potentially because there were no planets which could be subject to that law. Uh, in this sense, uh, field of rationality is at least potent, potentially pre present uh, as a m sort of, of pattern for the functioning of the universe. And the aim of my talk is to make this idea of the field of rationality less fuzzy by relating this idea to the ontologically interpreted category theory. Where we, by the ontological interpretation, I will understand ontological interpretation in the sense of quine. Uh, I will, later on I will explain what does it mean. And the um, plan of my talk is roughly speaking the following. First of all, a very brief reminder of some concepts taken from category theory, the concepts like functor, natural, uh, transformation, adjoint operators, uh, uh, yeah, uh, adjoint functor, and so on. Uh, I shall not give um, precise definitions of these concepts. I, I will assume that uh, everybody knows that, and if this assumption is wrong in some particular case, my um, style of presentation perhaps will help to have some correct or more or less correct um, intuitions. And then I, sh I will say something about the category theory and logic. Then I ex explain what does it mean ontology in the sense of Quine. And then I will relate the idea of the field of rationality with the field of categories. And some remarks on the effectiveness of mathematics will close my reflections. First, the concept of a category. A category, C, consists of data, structure, and properties. Data consists of objects and morphisms between objects. Morphisms are not to be confounded with functions. Functions may be morphism, but morphism can be uh, something very different, which is not a function. Uh, so it is much more general concept. Uh, structure consists of some laws which morphism objects uh, should satisfy, especially composition of morphisms and identities of morphisms. Uh, and properties, they are um, laws of associativity and the unit axioms. Uh, well, in this definition, objects, uh, reveal their presence in two roles. First, to guarantee the existence of, the obje of, of, of an object. Uh, the, uh, the morphism, identity morphism, uh, gives an uh, guarantees the, uh, the existence of, of this object because the object is something which is I identical with itself. And uh, mm, uh, Morphisms provide also domains and codomains, domains and codomains 
for, for, for morphisms. Uh, objects provide domains and codomains for, for morphisms. Uh, this role, uh, the existence of, um, uni of uh, unique morphs, uh, unit morphs, morphisms assures the existence of objects. As I said, the object X can be identified with its identity morphism. And uh, this identification of domains and codomains, uh, in, in this sense, m m must satisfy these axioms as, as, as associativity and others in order to make the coherent si system with uh, entire system. There is an old tradition in the philosophy of mathematics going back at least to Leibniz to get rid of objects. Uh, you remember the famous discussion between Leibniz and Newton whether um, uh, space and time are, are objects or set of relations. And this philosophy to get rid of objects, philosophy um, going back to Leibniz, was never successful in spite of many tricks to dispose with them, with objects. They always re-entered through the back door. And this is also the case uh, with the category theory. Uh, there exists an uh, axiomatization of that theory, which is called objectless axiomatization. In this axiomatization, uh, objects do, do not appear. Uh, however, <coughs> it, it is only apparent because um, objects are virtually present in those, in these axioms, um, through the existence of identity axioms. Nevertheless, um, morphisms seem to be more important, at least in two ways. In principle, all relevant information about objects can be recovered from considered all morphisms. Morphisms are sometimes ca called arrows. A morphism ingoing and outgoing from a given object. So you can, in the sense, forget about objects and consider all objects or morphisms which go to the object and go, go out of, of this object. It does not mean that the status of objects in the category theory is reduced to dimensionless points uh, in the network, network, network of arrows. It does not mean that arrows are more important conceptual structure of the theory of uh, category is subtle, subtle and rich enough to capture even the size and inner structure of even infinitely uh, large objects. So objects are also very important. An example, let, let N uh, be the set of all natural numbers considered as monoid. Uh, and um, it can be uh, regarded as, an, as a category, and this category has only one object, N is a one object, uh, and the only one object, all monoidal categories has, has, have only one object, and each natural number, each particular number, is an arrow in this category. So you can see that arrow need not be uh, a function or relation. It is a number. And the composition of um, uh, arrows is just a multiplication of numbers. And we should notice that N, this single object in this category, uh, from the viewpoint of the set theory, is a countably infinite. So one object that is infinite. Moreover, it can be that what is morphism in one category can be the object in another category. Here we have an example. Let us consider, sorry, let us consider uh, the category C. And we define another category denoted C with this arrow pointing downwards. And this category is called category of arrows. Objects of this new category are morphisms of the category C, of the old category. So this is an object of a new category. And arrows, we have one object, one arrow, another arrow. And uh, the morphism in this new category 
is a pair of morphisms such that this square is commutative. So this relation, so it's in, it doesn't matter where you go that way or that way. By the way, this is an example of something which I mentioned later, which is called a, a two category. Uh, so morphisms are morphisms in one category, but in the second category, in two category, they are objects. And of course, we can construct not only two categories, but three categories, four categories, and categories. Uh, so we see that this hierarchical, hierarchical structure is very complicated, very, very rich. And now, can category be, be treated as an object in some other category? So we go one step further. Yes, uh, it can be done. And correct morphisms between categories are called functors. And more or less the definition of functor is the following. A functor from a category C to category D transforms objects of one category into objects of another category and morphisms of one category into morphisms of another category in such a way that the structure of the category C is preserved. Of course, it must be defined in, in which sense, but uh, roughly speaking. And in principle, the discussions from the previous slides uh, concerning the relationship between objects and the morphism can be repeated here with respect to categories and uh, as objects and functors as morphism, with uh, the condition that the hierarchical structure of the whole edifice should be taken into account. Among, um, among functors, especially two, sort of functors are important. Uh, the first one are called natural transformations. So uh, let, us, uh, let, let us have one category, we call it source category, and this is target category. And then we have two functors pointing the same way, F, factor F, and factor G. And the natural transformation between these two functors is a family of morphisms, this family of morphisms, we have source we, we pick up uh, uh, an object A in this category, source category. We transform this object to the target, target category with the help of um, factor F. And we transform the same object uh, with the help of the factor G to have GA. And we consider this transformation already, it is a morphism within the category target. And we consider a set of all these um, morphisms indexed by, by ob objects of this category. And this is called this family uh, of objects indexed by, by A, by, by, by objects of the category. Source is called natural category. Uh, the concept of naturality it was used in, math in mathematics even before, and it is used very often. We say that something is natural, something is not natural, but this, it was never formalized. And the first paper uh, concerning um, ca category theory, it was 1946, MacLean and Eilenberg. Uh, they, one of their main goals was to formalize the, the, the notion of naturality. And it turns out that this uh, definition functions in whole of mathematics. Uh, well, and uh, another important class of functors are adjoint functors. Uh, to explain, uh, let us consider also the source uh, category and target cat category, and two functors. One is going from source to target, and another, just vice versa, from target to source. We pick up. Uh, object A here and object S here. And we want to compare the object A with the object S. But they reside in different places. What, how we can compare them? Uh, so, for instance, one object could be uh, from the group category, another from vector spaces or something else, and you want to compare them. How to do that? <laughs> 
let us first start with the source category. We pick up this object A here from this category and we transport the object S with the help of G to the category of source and we compare them here. But it can be done in other way around. We can first transform object A with the help of F to the target co category here and compare it with S. And this should be equivalent in some sense. Uh, this can be illustrated in the following way. Uh, we have two categories, Palace of Capulets and Palace of Montague, two different places, and they want to be together, Juliet and Romeo, and this can be done in two ways. Uh, this can be done in two ways. For instance, we can, uh, Romeo can transport himself with the help of category G uh, here to to Julia and they will be together. But it can be done uh, in other way. So the Juliet can be transported to, to Romeo with the help of functor F and they will be together. And these are supposed to be uh, equivalent in a sense. And if A, uh, alpha, this comparison, is a natural isomorphism. Isomorphism is natural in the previous sense. Uh, then F is said to be a left adjoint to G and G a right ad adjoint to, to F. Uh, the concept of adjoint functors was introduced by Kahn in 1958 and it transformed the category theory from, well, some local, uh, rather instrumental theory into something which is considered to be very fundamental for, for mathematics. And the adjoint functors pervade all mathematics. Sometimes very far away structures can be uh, compared with the help of adjoint functors. Why it is uh, that important from the philosophical point of view? Uh, Eilenberg and MacLean, in the original paper, introduced the concept of the isomorphism of categories. And this concept of isomorphism is nothing especially uh, revealing, nothing especially new. We have two uh, functors. Functor F uh, is from C to category C to category D. And it is isomorphism if there exists a functor G, going from different, uh, the, the opposite direction, such that uh, if we fa first go from C to D, uh, we, um, uh, we, we f obtain unit of C, uh, and other way around, if we start with G and we go back to, uh, we start with G here from D to C, and from C to D we obtain the same unit. So it's very, very uh, obvious definition, but it was Grotendieck who noticed that many functor categories that are not isomorphic with, isomorphic with each other in, in this sense, in this, uh, this, uh, sorry, oh. in this sense, uh, he noticed that um, there are functor categories that are not isomorphic with each, with each other but nevertheless they should be regarded as a categorically the same. And he proposed another definition of the equivalence of categories. Namely, he proposed to change this equality sign with the sign of naturally isomorphic. So he loosened, loosened uh, the criterion of identity. Uh, and this uh, turned out to be extremely important. The equivalence of categories should be regarded as giving uh, to categories the identity. But we should warn, be warned that the identity is not to be understood in the usual set theoretic sense. The ontology of categories is different from the ontology of sets. Here is a quotation from uh, a very well-known book of Marquis, who is a great specialist for, uh, on uh, category theory. In a set, he writes, two elements 
are either the same or different. In a category theory, two objects can be the same in a way, while still be different. Even more importantly, two objects can be the same in a more than one way. It depends how, uh, uh, how the concept of naturality uh, enters uh, that definition. Well, uh, category theory is a very beautiful theory and um, even to, to classically thinking uh, philosopher, it gives a lot of surprises. One of the surprises is the relation to logic. In the category theory, there is something which is called sub-object classifier. It is a special object, uh, omega, usually denoted by omega, in a given category. Uh, first, uh, there is a concept of sub-object, and sub-object is um, defined with the help of morphisms, uh, because there are, uh, in category theory, ob there are objects, but we do not ascribe elements to objects in the traditional sense. We use uh, morphism rather than, uh, than elements. So uh, if there is an object X is a sub-object of, uh, of some other object, if there is a monomorphism of that from this object to the other one. And omega identifies or classifies sub-objects of a given object by assigning the values true to elements. Elements are defined with the help of morphism belonging to this uh, subset in question and false to the elements not belonging to this sub-object. So it is like one and zero in classical logic. Uh, this is why um, it is called uh, sub-object classifier or uh, truth value object. Uh, there is a, a certain class of, of categories which are called topoi, in sing, topos in singular, and uh, the existence of uh, sub-object classifiers is a part of the definition of topos. Uh, in general, it is the algebra of this sub-object classifier of omega that determines the internal logic of a given topos. So various categories may have different internal logics. And uh, in the case of a general topos, the, these rules, this omega, determines intuitionistic calculus, not classical ones. And this kind of surprise. Uh, in other uh, categories, there may be another lo logic. For instance, paraconsistent logic or something else. And now, uh, another important concept, important for my talk, the ontology in the sense of Quine. Ontology in the sense of Quine is constructed not in order to know what there is, this is a quotation for, from, from Quine, but in order to know what a given remark or doctrine, ours or somebody else, else's says there is. So we are not concerned with the what exists in the real world, like in Aristotelian logic, but we have a certain uh, doctrine or theory and we want to know which kind of object this theory presupposes. Uh, to construct such an ontology in, a, in the rigorous way, one should paraphrase a given doctrine or theory into the first order logical calculus this is a recipe given by, by, by Quine, and look for those variables in, uh, in, in this uh, paraphrased uh, <laughs> theory that are bound by the existential quantifiers. And of course, this theory presupposes only existence of such objects which uh, corresponds to variables uh, uh, bound by the existential quantifiers. And th in this sense, the, ex the name existential quantifier is a very good one because uh, it is connected with what given theory assumes that exists. We ask then the question, 
the existence of which entities should be postulated in order that the affirmations made by a theory, category theory, be true. The Quinian way of asking this question presupposes classical logic, first order logical calculus, but it is classical logic, but we can ask, is it classical logic correct for a category theory? We saw that various categories presuppose various logics. As we have seen in principle, each topos has its own internal logic. Consequently, we should apply Quine's program to each category individually by employing its own internal logic and speak about the ontology in the sense of Quine characteristic for a given category in terms of a given logical calculus. But the Quine ontological program does not directly refer to the internal logic of a given theory, but rather to the logic with the help of which we are interpreting this theory, the entire category theory, the external or metalogic. And this is expected to be the standard classical logic. This is also the case with respect to the category theory. When developing this theory, category theory, for instance by proving theorems, we are using standard logical laws of inference. This is why we seem to be entitled to ontologically interpret category theory strictly following Quine's recipe, that is to say by using order uh, logical calculus, classical logical cal calculus. However, we should be aware that this could be conditioned by the fact that our brain is a macroscopic object embedded into the world having a, the ontology characteristic for the category of sets. And this is a nice quotation from the handbook uh, of category theory. Uh, no system of rules can capture all of the rich and complex world of human thoughts. Some are very unlogical. And thus every logic can, made, can mer merely be used as a limited purpose tool rather than as an ultimate oracle responding to all possible questions. We should keep that in mind. Well, even a superficial look at mathematics convinces us that it has a very rich ramified hierarchical structure and that this hierarchy is itself richly structured with the help of dependencies of different kinds, generalizations, limiting cases, extensions, meta-theories, etc., etc. Category theory offers a possibility to formalize also this aspect or this, these aspects of the field of mathematics. The hierarchical structure of category theory can be explored at least in two different ways, and it is explored, in fact, by developing the so-called category of categories. Uh, you, should, you could consider all possible categories and factors between them, but uh, this huge structure is uh, difficult or impossible to strictly uh, being investigated because all um, Russell type para paradoxes of course are um, uh, replicated in, in the category of n categories but there are several ways how to avoid uh, this um, these problems and this is under the very um, rich and scrutiny and another way uh, to explore this hierarchy of categories is the theory of n categories. I mentioned already two categories, three categories. In fact, um, a workable um, categories are up to n equal, not larger than four, because higher on uh, very great difficulties, both conceptual and practical uh, occur. Uh, as huge collection of categories as possible without being involved in logical paradoxes, I propose to call field of cate categories. So it is rather an intu intuitive name. More precisely, I will speak about the field of categories uh, in the sense uh, to denote a Quine-like interpretation of category theory. So I shall apply uh, or I att may an attempt to apply Quine-like uh, interpretation of category theory and the result will be called field of categories. 
And I suggest that Rzeczyński's mm, uh, understanding mm, should be identified, of field of, of rationality should be identified with, with the field of categories. Uh, uh, this is a little warning. Even if this move deviates a little, perhaps not a little, from uh, Rzeczyński's original idea, it makes it less fuzzy and paves the way for the further discussions. Then, what does it mean, uh, what uh, does categories um, theory say there is? We should explore this question. Uh, we could answer, of course we, we cannot, you, it is impossible now to make a paraphrase into the first order calculus, or the entire theory of category, this is just a, a, an impossible dream. So we can do that uh, more or less in an intuitive way. So we can answer these questions by pointing to objects and morphisms as presupposed by category theory. But they do not exist independently of each other. It, uh, it, they exist de de dependently on a given category. What is amorphous in one category could be an object in another one. And the same should be said about categories themselves and functors between them. Uh, category theory certainly says that there is a certain global structure. It is global in the sense that no part of it is more fundamental than the other. Even speaking on its parts is risky and should only be understood as an approximation. Uh, one of the best um, specialists of the category theory, the author of very, very good textbooks, uh, Steve Aude, uh, strongly objected against looking for some categorical foundations of mathematics as rival to compl uh, or complementary with theoretical foundations. In his view, one should use category theory to avoid the whole business of foundations. It's a different view o on, on mathematics. Although the concepts of morphism as a functor depend on a category, they pervade all the category theory. Um, the theory is, so to speak, spanned by them. Such no notions as relation, connection, property, operation uh, are subsumed under these two crucial concepts. And how they rhetorically, rhetorically enumerate? You need relations, use products and monomorphism. You need operations, morphism or products. Uh, homomorphism, consider the category of structures. Connections between structures, use functors between categories. Connections among connections, categories of functors, and so on it goes. Philosophers would be happy to notice that such an ontology emphasizes form over content. It's again Aude's uh, quotation. Uh, form over content, descriptions over constructions, specification of assumptions over deductive foundations, characterization of essential properties over constitution of objects having those properties. And uh, all this is done within the category theory in a very strict, precise manner with theorems, proofs, and so on. Um, so we can ask the same question, the existence of which entities does category theory presuppose? A structure of structures rather than well-individualized objects and some relations between them. And a structure of structures that exhibits various its aspects depending on the perspective we adopt when contemplating it. It seems that before making these suggestions more precise, some further studies uh, of the category ca of categories and n categories should be undertaken. Uh, and it cannot be excluded, what is, this is important, that when doing such studies, one would have to go beyond classical logic. Perhaps the field of categories presupposes its own uh, categoric logic. It would be a very uh, much in the style of this uh, theory. And what about Gödel's theorems in this perspective? In the light of such an ontology, it seems obvious that the axiomatic method 
is our method of doing mathematics rather than the method of, of mathematics itself. When choosing a system of axioms and deductive rules, we pick up a subfield of the field of categories and cut it off artificially from its natural mathematical environment. That is to say, from the rest of the category field. And here, the incompleteness theorem of Gödel's type could have the deep structure. They would say more about the process of cutting off uh, from uh, the field of categories than about limitations of mathematical as such. We can imagine just intuitively that if we pick up a subfield of category theor theory uh, in a very in, in a too large scale, we, we cut off a too big area of category of categories, then uh, inconsistencies and contradictions can be produced. And if you pick too small region, there will be incompleteness. <coughs> and now the last part of my considerations. Why is mathematics so effective in the mathematical sciences, in this perspective? To uncover categorical structures hidden between, be, behind the layers of the usual mathematical stuff, in physics for instance, one must do what is now common to call categorification and, uh, of, of standard mathematical structures. Uh, so that is to say, we pick up a mathematical, some mathemat mathematical theory, theory of, say, rings or, or algebras, and we try to categorify it, to, to look at corresponding category and corresponding functions. And this, this is called categorification. And uh, then it can be applied to physics. We can take um, Maxwell equations that try to categorize it. And uh, this is a very richly developing uh, field of research now. Uh, well, interestingly, in this process, equations between functions, yeah, st standard equations, trans uh, are transfo transformed or correspond to natural isomorphism between functors. Of course, it's very difficult, especially for those who are trained in the classical thinking. Uh, but it does work. Uh, if one studies categorification, one soon discovers, this is a quotation from uh, Bias and Dolan, these two guys, especially the first one, uh, is a leading uh, mathematician and physicist who is doing this uh, categorification of physics, and he publishes a lot, especially on his um, page, uh, web pages, but also in print. If one studies categorification, one soon discovers an amazing fact. Many deep-sounding results in mathematics are just categorifications of facts we learned in high school. If you try to categorify uh, some results we learned in, at the high school, it turns out that it is very, well, say, um, deep um, uh, theorem of mathematics like Gelfand theorem, for instance. Uh, and there is a good reason for that. All along, we have been unwittingly decategorifying mathematics in our mathematical activity by pretending that categories are just sets. And we decategorify a category by forgetting about the morphism and pretending that, mor uh, that isomorphism of objects are equal. Uh, we are left with a mere set, the set of isomorphism classes of objects, and this makes the rich structures poor. The reverse process, the process of categorification, is much more involved, but it is now under the intense scrutiny. Moreover, in this process, one naturally must go uh, from one category to two categories and even higher level categories. <coughs> All this strongly suggests that when we claim that the universe is mathematical, we should think that the universe is categorical. 
And the question, why is the universe mathematical, should, should be rephrased to why is the universe categorical? It sounds as only a changing the name, but when our understanding process <coughs> progresses, it could signify a deeper conceptual shift. Yes, why not? And there are some attempts or some, at least some plans to do that. Yeah. And the very good mathematicians, like for instance Manin, is doing categorification of physics. So they start with, uh, some, some work has been done in quantum mechanics. And Baez, I mentioned him, uh, he, he was a specialist, he, he was busy in the loop uh, theory. And then string theory, and he decided that there are so many difficulties that we must go to deeper level of mathematical tools and do something radically new and she started doing categorification. So perhaps we are at the onset of the new mathematics and new physics. Yes? What are the examples of morphing fusion functions? I mentioned, for instance, this um, uh, arrow category. So the morphism, the arrow category, are a pair of, of functions, say. But uh, I also mentioned the category of um, natural numbers, which is a monoid category, when there is only one object, the set of all numbers, and each individual number is an arrow. So number is an arrow, not, not, not function or relation. And uh, pardon. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, if we speak about the categorification of quantum mechanics, it turns out that uh, Hilbert space is a categorification of uh, finite sets, simply, <laughs> yeah, finite dimensional Hilbert space. Yeah, Zyciński, Zyciński uh, adopted very strongly platonic view that all this structure exists in some way. Um, if you like, you can interpret this field of categories in a platonic way as well. Uh, but usually the platonic world is considered to be the set of uh, objects or structures which exist in some other world. But uh, it could be understood in this way that it is neither objects nor, nor relations, but it depends how you look and from which, which perspective you look. But uh, as you know, uh, uh, I didn't mention in the rest of my talk about Plato or something, so you can treat that also simply as a kind of chapter of foundations of mathematics without any metaphysical connotations. But it is, of course, up to, up to you. <laughs> 